And terrorists strike again in the Indonesian city of Surabaya, the latest attacks carried out by a family of five who'd been in Syria. Okay, first up tonight, Lejko is taking ousted lawmaker Lung Kwok Kung to court, demanding he pay back almost $3 million in salaries and allowances pocketed before he was disqualified. The reason, its president says, is because he snubbed a government deal to pay back just a fraction of that amount. Last month, the LegCo Commission actually decided to stop chasing Lung and three other lawmakers for their pay packets. It did, however, ask the group, ousted over the oath-taking saga, to pay back expenses they'd racked up of up to $310,000. Nathan Law, Edward Yu and Lao Xiu Lai all agreed to that, but Lung never actually responded. LegCo says it's been backed into a corner, despite saying it didn't want to waste taxpayer money chasing the funds back in the courts. If we do nothing, that means from now on, all the Commission's decision is only a paper tiger. Although we may not want to choose to go that route, but we've got no choice but to uh, make clear that you know, our offer were genuine. If you don't accept our offer, we have no choice but to choose uh, the mean of you know, legal action to recover all the money. Well, Lung Kwok Kung isn't taking Lejko's decision too well. He claims it's too soon for the council to demand he pay back the salary and expenses. I, I will uh, write a letter to them or I will, I will just simply uh, tell them uh, it, 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 it's a mistake to uh, claim my money back before the appeal on the JL and the uh, um, and the disqualification of my post. It's too early. All right, Evelina Lung has been following these developments. She joins me now in the studio. So, Evelina, uh, Longhair seems to be actually accusing LegCo of some double standards here, He's saying that they're treating different lawmakers uh, differently. Is that actually the case, though? Well, yes, Lung Kuo Hung actually used um, Young Inspiration's Sixus Lung and Yao Wei Cheng as an example. Now, the pair were kicked out over the oath taking saga. Now, Lung said Lung waited until their case was dealt with by the court of final appeal before demanding they pay back their salaries and allowances. However, for him, his appeal case hasn't even begun yet. I mean, his appeal case against his disqualification. And already, Lai Chiu is demanding that he pay back his salary and allowances. Now, Leung also said that he agrees with Lai Chiu's stance, which is to demand all ousted legislators to pay back their salaries and allowances. However, he believes that this should only happen after the court has made a ruling in his appeal case. Well, well speaking of, uh, where's his appeal case up to? Uh, well, let me quickly refresh your memory on what happened that led to Long Hair's disqualification. Now, Leung, along with three other Democrats, Nathan Law, Edward Yu, and Lao Siu Lai, were kicked out of the council for failing to take their oaths properly. Law and Yu did not appeal their disqualifications, but uh, Leung and Lao did. Um, for Lao and Yu, a by-election was held to fill their seats earlier this year. Now, according to Learn today, his hearing won't begin until April next year. Mm -hmm. If he and Lao lose their appeal, another round of by-election will be held to fill their seats. All right, so a lot of developments coming out of this and uh, a Indeed. pretty hefty bill for long hair if he chooses not yes. to pay up. Evelina, thank yes. you so much for that. Uh, keeping with local news, and the High Court judge presiding over Edward Lung's riot trial has instructed the jury to focus on the facts and ignore his political views and past controversies. Lung, a member of localist group Hong Kong Indigenous and four others, are uh, accused of taking part in the 2016 Mong Kok riots. Now, they deny the charges, but Lung has pleaded guilty to one count of assaulting police. While giving guidance to the nine jurors, the judge acknowledged the case stemmed from the public discontent over the government's handling of street hawkers, but she stressed their verdict must be based solely on evidence presented in court and should not be influenced by media reports. The government has come under scrutiny from lawmakers over the way it provides subsidies to non-governmental organisations. There are calls for the administration to do away with the lump sum grant system which provides groups with a single payment each year. Joel Flynn now tells us more about, why the, about the scheme and why there is so much opposition towards it. OK, so what exactly is the lump sum grant? Well, the system began in 2001 to replace the traditional reimbursement schemes under which the government would pay NGOs costs 
after money had been spent. The current scheme gives a lump sum of money to NGOs up front every year. Now, according to the 2001 review, the idea was that this change would make NGOs use the money more effectively to lower their own costs and find value. So in the year 2015-2016, 165 NGOs received a total of $11.8 billion. That sum increased to $12.5 billion the following year. While funding might be increasing under this plan, social workers have told VIEW TV News this scheme does little to improve their services. Because of the lump sum grant system, the government shifted responsibility to social welfare organisations, but without an effective monitoring mechanism. The salary of social workers is based on the organisations themselves, and they can't retain experienced professionals. If there's not enough funding for some services, the organisation will have to bid for funding. But when there's lack of resources, some services will be cut. So lawmakers are now looking at whether this scheme needs rethinking and not for the first time. Earlier this month, the Public Accounts Committee said it had grave concern and dissatisfaction over the government's failure to monitor the work of NGOs after offering them subsidies. That was essentially because some NGOs were running up large debts while others were stockpiling the handouts. The committee also said the Social Welfare Department had failed to ensure NGOs publicly declare the pay of their most senior staff. Now, all of this points to the fundamental problems associated with government funding for anything, of course, which is accountability. Politicians and social workers have welcomed this chance to review the current system, uh, with some suggesting it might be better to go back to the previous way of doing things. For others, though, the bigger question is not how social work is being funded, but whether it's being funded enough. That was Joel Flynn there. Four people have been charged with conspiracy to murder over the killing of a man at Cheplak Cock earlier this month. Police believe another person responsible for disposing the victim's body at a construction site is still on the run. The suspects faced Shatin magistrates court today in their first appearance. They were among five men and two women arrested yesterday. Police believe the 30-year-old victim knew his attackers and was beaten to death after an argument at a Mong Kok drug den. Well, thousands of doctors are demanding the hospital authority clearly define their responsibilities after one of their colleagues was charged over a deadly medical blunder. The medic was deemed guilty of professional misconduct over a 2011 death in which his nurses covered a cancer patient's breathing hole with gauze. Some 5,000 doctors, almost half of the city's total, have signed a joint petition saying they can't possibly take care of every single detail when treating patients. The victim's family says the campaign is a way to shift blame, but the Hong Kong Medical Association says it just wants a watch, the watchdog to clearly outline the roles of doctors and nurses. Each position has its own system of management. For example, in nursing there is a chief nurse, which itself is already a very comprehensive management mechanism. It's true that doctors bear the responsibility for the overall treating process, but the question is whether they can take care of all the little things of all of their patients. That's impossible. An investigation is shining a spotlight on Hong Kong's optometrists with revelations some may be taking advantage of a healthcare loophole. Now TV has found cases of optical shops issuing healthcare vouchers without a registered practitioner on site. Its probe found one in particular where regular employees who aren't registered have been issuing vouchers to elderly customers. According to the current rules, only the 641 registered optometrists are allowed to provide this service, yet there are more than 2,000 stores which claim they can give out tickets. Employees and optometrists risk criminal charges and suspension if caught. All right, coming up next, time to have a look at the world of business. OK, well, Hong Kong shares have certainly picked up where they left off last week, extending their winning streak to six straight days. Investors tracked a strong lead on Wall Street, pushing the Hang Seng Index 1.35 per cent higher to 31,541 points. Industrials and developers outperforming. It was, however, a turbulent day for Apple component supplier AAC Technologies after releasing Q1 earnings. Shares leapt early on after a 5.7 per cent rise 
rise in profit before plunging to a one-week low. But the company says it has been largely shielded from all the trade friction between the US and China. Mainland markets, meanwhile, jumped on signs that those trade tensions are finally easing. The Shanghai Composite finished up 0.34%. Investors were also spurred on as they await the MSCI's final A-share inclusion list. Elsewhere, though, an ugly session for Malaysian markets, which opened for trade for the first time since Mahathir Mohamed's shock election win. The main boss actually hit a three-month low within minutes of the opening bell, but eventually recovered to end the day up 1.25%. Now, markets are also awaiting key data in the coming days, which will put the strength of the global economy under the microscope. Japan and Germany, they both release their GDP figures this week, and the US publishes its retail sales. As Kira Lee reports, it could also be a make-or-break period for the NAFTA trade talks. Big spenders or big savers? That will be the question on Tuesday when US retail sales for April are released. Tax changes are estimated to have reduced annual personal taxes by over $115 billion. That should mean more money for consumers. But a Reuters poll expects sales to grow just 0.4 per cent from March's 0.6 per cent rise. Other data dominating will come from Japan. Its economy is expected to have contracted for the first time in two years in the first quarter due to weak private consumption and softer export demand. But some say it may only be temporary. Even though we continue to see CPI targets pushed further out into the middle distance, I think there are some signs of uh, constructive uh, impetus in the terms of the Japanese economy. I think the labour market is in a particular one, uh, in, especially where we're now starting to see some signs of wage growth uh, picking up. Q1 GDP figures are also expected from Germany, with some analysts predicting a deceleration there too. Updating the North American free trade agreement has stalled over autos. There are now just weeks left to reach an agreement before negotiators hit challenges caused by a Mexican presidential election and midterm elections in the U.S. The coming days seen by investors as a make or break to seal a deal between trading partners Mexico, Canada and the U.S. OK, time for a break, but when we return, a classic case of, well, classics in Monte Carlo. Vintage cars hit the Riviera ahead of the famed Monaco Grand Prix. On the road to becoming the best in the field, we pledge to revamp the world through television.